to us through the ministry of his word. You know, I'm not one big on feelings, but um, I'm going to have to confess to you that my heavenly home is bright and fair, and I feel like moving up. That's just the way I feel. I know there's some people feel differently, but I feel like traveling on. That's what I feel like. I have feelings. And then what we're going to talk about today, hearing the hope of the gospel, it's, 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 that's involved in it too. And the title of my sermon today is The Hope of the Gospel. And it's my desire today to identify or to highlight how hope is relevant to the gospel. I'd like to say at the start that there is no other hope likened to the one generated by the belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other hope like that hope. There is no other hope offered by men or fallen angels. You know, they do offer you some kind of hope. That will get you ready to stand before a holy God without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. There's... Men, they may hold out a whole bunch of stuff. But if it's got to go in the end, I don't want to hope in it. And if I can have it now, then why would I hope for it? Counterfeit hope produces counterfeit awareness. People who promise you something that don't make you acutely aware of the judgment, well, you got to have to think about that. Do you want to become involved in something that won't make you ready for the judgment? Counterfeit hope produces counterfeit readiness. A person can actually believe they're ready, but their judgment's faulty. They're not really ready. Any message that does not gender this kind of hope, now the kind of hope I'm talking about is in 1 John 3, 3, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So if it's not that kind of hope, just throw it away. Just get rid of it. Just don't hope in it anymore. Now, this text of Scripture, where this text has been extracted from, is um, Colossians 1.23, but I'm going to back up a little bit. I want to get some perspective. It's good to have perspective in the kingdom of God. And this is how, if I ever start reading at verse 21, and you, now I'm talking to you today. I'm talking to you. The real you, not, not, not the, the old you. I've, I've, I kind of spin my wheels for years talking to the old you. It don't get nowhere. You know, the old you will stand at the foot of the mountain and say, I'll do everything you say, and then you walk away, and they have no intentions of doing what you say. I know this because I look in the mirror a lot, and I see that old you, and I have to tell them, you're a dead man. Sometimes I have this na-na-na-na-na spirit. You know, you go, you don't get in. You caused me a lot of trouble. I'm going to get to shed you one of these days. That's part of the hope. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yeah, that's the one I'm talking about, that one that was delivered. Paul's, Paul's setting us up now. He's setting us up to where what he says next is going to mean something. You that were enemies in your mind by wicked works. You were the enemy of God because of what you did. So please, people don't try to tell me that it doesn't make any difference what you do. You were enemies of God because of what you did. You did the wrong thing. And because of that, you were the enemies. I don't want to be God's enemy. Yet now, now there's a now. There's a then. And a now, now he hath reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. I said something there. Through death to present you. That's the new you. <laughs> the old you is going to die. Doesn't get to come. All right, so they present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I haven't got to my text yet, but that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 
That's how I could camp out right there. <laughs> yeah, that, that old you, that one that offended God, that one that made you an enemy of God, it's gone now because he died. He made it possible for you to not be dominated by this old man. When I was a kid, we used to sit around at agape time and I'd listen to the, to the elders speak. Boy, there was some high talk going on. But I picked up one thing. They hated this old man. I didn't know who he was, but they hated him. They didn't want nothing to do with him. I thought, these are pretty, usually pretty gentle, kind people. And all I know, they, they hate this old man. I've come to hate him too. Now this is a little demonstration built into the text here about this hope. So let me read it again. You now, you, the ones that were dominated by the flesh, the ones that were, they were taken captive by Satan at his will. Just any time he wanted to, he could just work in you. These are the ones that he's talking about now. These are the ones that were delivered. Yet now he's reconciled in the body of his flesh through his death. He presented himself as a spotless lamb and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he took it away. Now, because that happened, now you can be reconciled to God. You can, you can have peace. You can come close to God. This is all built into the hope of the gospel. Now, the question is, and this is the demonstration, is does that sound good to you? What I just said, does that, is that appealing to you? Do you find yourself longing for that to be accomplished? That you'll have the fullness. You know, you've got... In part, you've got, but you've got it, right? You've got it. And you know you got it because when you hear this, you get filled with anticipation. And you start thinking, you start thinking really wild things like, I can't wait till I lay down this body and take up my new body. Well, that's a radical thinking, isn't it? I can't wait till I die. You say that too much and they might put you in a sane asylum or something, lock you up. It's a crazy man. He's thinking about dying. Well, ever since I was made new, I've been thinking about dying. I've been thinking about it. It's dominating my thinking. See, before you die with Christ, hope doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything at all. You're not going to get somebody that's living for themselves to have a dominant hope of another world. It's not going to happen. Now, he did all this, he made all this possible to present you. <laughs> We're like a presentation. We're like a, a trophy of the greatness of Christ. You want to see how great Christ is? He can take something that was alienated from the life of God. Somebody who was an enemy of God. You, you put him in Christ's hands. This is what God did. He, you put him in Christ's hands. And what does he deliver to God? Well, it's not the heathen, right? But that's what he was given. I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, but what he presents to God is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Amen. Now, it's that message. That's the message that will get the people ready to be presented. Whatever our text means, if you want to just get wax academic, whatever our text means... The result of it will modify the character of the person. It will make them holy and unblameable and unreprovable. But whatever he's talking about, this is, this is really serious stuff here. This is essential for your transformation. But then he says something that some people will not even acknowledge is in the Bible. He says, if. That's what he said. I can look it up, but it's, it's there. If you continue in the faith. Wait a minute. I thought all this salvation was on his side of the board. We didn't have to do anything. What's he talking about? If. Yes. It's if. Because this is being worked in you. <laughs> this is being worked in you. Yeah. If you continue in the faith. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So he's not talking about if you go out and do a whole bunch of good stuff. He's saying if you 
Remember that day when you were first illuminated? Remember that moment when it dawned on you? He took away my sin. There isn't anything you wouldn't have done for Christ. Right at that moment, if he'd have told you to go out and conquer the world, you'd have said, yes, Lord. I'll go out and conquer the world. I'll do it. But he says, say like this, how about crucifying the flesh? We'll start there. Just crucify your lust. We'll start there now. Son, I know you, you want to do it all, but first of all, we're going to start here. You crucify. You keep your body in subjection. Amen. You do that, and we'll move on from there. Amen. And the apostle's telling you, no matter how much you do and how far you go, don't you ever move away from the hope of the gospel. Don't you ever move away from that moment. you got to keep this in memory. That's what he keeps saying. He keeps telling us this. Why? Because it's got to happen. No one's going to, you can't build a relationship with Christ on your works. You can try, but see, you'll, you'll fail every time. you got to build it on what he did. He, he, there's anything you can do that's valid or that will be, in other words, will be productive in the kingdom of God that's built on the foundation of what you do. It's all got to be built on the foundation of what he did. He's accomplished it for us, and we remember that he accomplished it for us. That's what he's saying. If you keep it in memory, we not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, the same one I taught you, the same one that, that converted you. That same hope, that same message is the one that's going to keep you in, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, well, wait a minute. That, is that in there? It was preached. It was preached to every creature under heaven. Well, that answers a lot of theology. We can just scratch a lot of stuff, a lot of bad stuff going out. This, this, this really was preached to every creature. It really was. Unless, of course, the main article there is wrong, but I think it's right. It, it, this is the same gospel he's saying that's preached to everybody. This is the gospel of Christ. Now, the proclamation of the gospel of Christ is the remedy for man's greatest need. So until you really understand what he's talking about, what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news, right? So when you say the good news of the gospel, really you're saying the good news of the good news, and it is good news. The good news of the good news is good news. It really is. That is, if you understand that you're dead. If you understand that you're alienated from the life that's in God, if you really understand that, well, then the knowledge of a Savior, that's good news. But if you don't, you notice he, he says, if you continue in the faith, he says it like that. What he didn't say is, if God can keep you from falling. Now, later we'll find out that God can keep you from falling, but that isn't what he said. That's not what he said. He said, if you continue in the faith. If we were to remove all the labels that men have placed over the doors of every religious institution in the world, you would find that all men share one very distinctive problem. They all have a commonality. And the problem is called sin. Every one of them have offended God. Now, as we minister, this has got to be the focus. We, if you're going to be a messenger of the gospel anyway, if you're not just promoting an institution or denominational slant, but if you're, if you're God's man now, if you're out there and you're doing God's work, you've got to minister with this in mind. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, who can I preach to? Am I limited in who I can preach to? Well, I'm, I'm going to limit myself to this much. I'm only going to limit to those who have sinned. That's the only people that I feel comfortable preaching to, is people that have sinned. Now, how big is my audience? Oh, that's it. That's all. So no matter who you come in contact with, they need this. They need, they need the hope of the gospel. Now, the next hurdle is how are you going to create that in them? I don't know that you can. I don't know it's possible. I don't think it's ever been laid on the, on the, the shoulders of man. It's you got to get the hope in the people. Oh, we preach Christ and him crucified. 
And I'm telling you, everyone that believes that, everyone that believes the record that God's given of His Son, the belief of that, just the very fact that they die to themselves and take up their cross, creates this hope. That's the kind of hope I want. So everyone sinned. Everyone. The fact that we're all descendants of Adam has left us morally bankrupt. I can't, I can try to lie my way out of it, but the fact is I'm related to Adam. That, that leaves me in a great deficit before God. Wherefore, as by one man, you're familiar with Romans 5, 12, sin entered into the world. Adam, what did you do that for? Well, you, know, you put yourself back in Adam's place and he, you'd find out why he did it. He didn't ask me to answer for Adam. He asked me to answer for me. I'm created with this, this, this image. It's a nature. I'm born with a nature. No one can escape their nature. Someone's going to have something supernatural has got to happen for you to be able to escape this nature. It's a proclivity. It's what's built into you. Brother Boyce adequately represented it to us. It's built into your DNA. So, death passed upon all men. For that, all have sinned. See, it, is, it isn't just that you have a sinful nature, although that by itself, you leave a baby long enough and he'll develop, he'll start, re, you'll start seeing. He's got a little bit of Adam in him. Look at the way he acts with other kids. Look at what he's, what'd you hit him for? What'd you do that for? Because I'm, Dad, don't you know I'm born from Adam? I got this nature. I got this nature in me that resists good. All sin. You have an inherited, you have inherited a fallen and a sinful nature. And on top of that, at some point in time, that nature has expressed itself. Well, this is good news. I mean, you got to put it in the context of the new man. Because that isn't... Anybody who's been born from above has a, another nature, a new nature. And that nature will express itself too, won't it? So see, he's setting this up. He, he, he's, he, he wants us to be able to reason properly when it comes to old man, new man. Well, now you all live out in the world. How many people you, hear, you come in contact with just talking about the old man and the new man? How many people do you rub shoulders with and say, you know, man, I've been crucifying that flesh today. That new man's just been getting the victory over that old man. How about you? See, this is not as well known as we would like it to be. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. Why? Why is it that way? Why can he say so universally, all have sinned? Because all all have a sinful nature. See, it isn't just like you just say, well, I wonder if maybe somebody will be born that won't sin. No, all have sinned and fallen short or come short or are coming short of the glory of God. Our dilemma must be seen correctly before the remedy will ever become relevant. Until you understand that there isn't anything you can do about this, how does Christ fit into that picture? If you think you can do, you, if you really believe with all your heart that you can take care of this problem on your own, how? Well, the fact is that in the flesh, all we're basically doing is compiling day after day. We just keep piling up and piling up and piling up and piling up transgression against the holy God. You say, well, but I, I can do it. I think I can do it. I, I mean, I didn't kill anybody. I'm not known for lying too much. No, you're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This is what you're saying. You're built into your nature. Don't try to pretend that you can work this out on your own. But God in his wisdom 
knowing that this God made us, this is not, this is not a stretch for God to be able to show us, really show us that we need a Savior. In the giving of the law, the one who was offended, that's God, gave a set of commands that the offenders, that's us, would have to faithfully keep 100% of the time. And then after they kept them, then they would be deemed righteous. You're, you're, you're righteous now. You, if you could do that, it was a legitimate offer, folks. It was legitimate. God wasn't pretending here. He laid it down. You, you want to be righteous? You, want, you think you can do it on your own? Here you go. I'm only going to give you 10. Do it. You do this and you'll live. Isn't that what he said? So how many of us can do it? How many can keep the law? Now see, there's not any way out of this now. It's not like you can say, well, I just can't do it. And that's going to excuse you. Like somehow that's going to excuse you. No, no, you got to do it now. And that's exactly what they said at the foot of the mount. We'll do everything that you've said. We'll do it. Just as long as you stop talking to us. We'll do it. Well, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And neither can any of us. But that doesn't excuse us from it. That's no excuse. You can't stand before a holy God and say, you made something too hard for us. That's the point. So I would say you're just not finally getting the point. You're getting the point that you need someone to save you. All right, and so Christ comes. God lays sin on him. He takes away the sin of the world. Does that mean that you're automatically in? Because if that's true, then the universalist is right. If that's true, if that's all it took, and Jesus just to show up on the scene, take away sin, and now all of humanity is wiped clean, boom, it's done. He goes back to heaven and then just waits for time to roll out, I guess. I mean, how else can you figure that out? So God gave the law because it served a purpose. It served. That's what Galatians says. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was for a reason. It wasn't just because God thought plan A, they can do this. They, no, see, that's, that's our thinking. That's a man's thought, not God's thought. It was added because of transgression. Man was a transgressor. The problem was he didn't know it. He didn't understand how far sin had taken the human race. He didn't know that the thoughts and the intents, that our heart was deceitfully wicked. He didn't know this. Neither did David until he got into the law. He said, deceitfully wicked. Deceitfully. You can't figure this out. Not on your own. God gave the law to serve a specific purpose. It shows and it reveals the fallen man just how fallen we really are. That's why Romans 3.20 comes in and says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. It wasn't, he didn't give the law to take away sin. He give, gave it to highlight sin. That's right. Highlight, because now that it's highlighted, see, it's it was in order that, now it's highlighted. We have the law. We, we know we don't have to be ignorant of our own sinful nature anymore. In fact, God doesn't ask anybody to pretend ever. Amen. In that respect, he's a realist. He, 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 wants you, he wants you to be honest with him. Come before him. If you found a problem, come before him. He said, if, you, if you'll be faithful to confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you from all unrighteous and to cleanse you from all ungodliness. This is our God. We don't have to pretend around God. It doesn't do me any good anyway. But it's good for men to know that. The truth, or this truth, remains truth even in our generation. Our generation is not exempt. So I didn't live way back there in the law. I didn't say I would do it at the foot of the mountain. So why do I have to keep the law? Because it's just and holy and good. Amen. You're made in the image of God, and this is God's law. So you don't, you don't have a way out. We're all going to have to stand before a holy God. And he's given us a schoolmaster. That's what the law was called. It's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So really, in the end, nobody will have an excuse and say, 
well, I didn't know I was supposed to go to Christ. Oh, the law will drive you there. It, it will. Of course, it only drives serious people there. Serious people who are, don't want to sin. Serious people who have acknowledged, I've tried it, but I can't do it. To say it crudely, the gospel, the schoolmaster brings us to Christ because the gospel is the only real fix for our situation. Amen. There's only one way out of this mess. It's interesting, more than interesting, it's profound that God encapsulated this whole remedy in a message. I mean, would, would, would you have done it that way? I, I don't know that I would have. I don't know that I would even know what to do. I would have to say, I don't know. You have to go ask somebody smarter than me. But God did it in a message. It's the proclamation of a message. Now, see, we can do that. <laughs> you see that? God did it in such a way that you can do that. You don't have to fall short in preaching the gospel. No man has to fall short in preaching the gospel. You can do it. You can, you can preach Christ. You can do it. What do you have to do? What do you have to do? Sign up for this. What do you have to know to do this? I want to do this. You got to know him. You got to know Christ before you can preach him. So what is the first thing he does? He, he puts you in the Christ. That's what he does. He's baptized in the Christ. He puts you in the Christ. And the next thing you know, I've, I've, I know you've known, met these people that they go away to camp and they come back and they're all fired up for Christ, right? They're all fired up. They, they've seen something. That's what I'm talking about. That's God puts you into Christ. This isn't something that just is an imaginary thing. This really did happen. God put you into Christ. And, and what's the first thing you want to do? You start telling people. I'm going to heaven. My sins have been taken away. Come go with me. Have you ever met people like that? I think you've all are people like that. <laughs> I think every one of you has had this experience to where nothing else mattered. Nothing. Don't move away from that hope. Amen. Don't move. Don't let life here on the earth diminish that hope Amen. he's promised you exceeding great and precious promises these promises are of another nature of another order only people who have a new nature can lust after these these things see your old man he lusts after all manner of wicked things but we have a new man and he lusts after different things there's a war going on inside of you. You got one side that's that's a work trying to pull you away from Christ, and the other one's telling you he's going to make you a pillar. He'll make you a pillar in the temple of his God. He'll do it. He'll write his name on your forehead. Don't don't give in. And you're you're right in the middle here. You you're you're going to have to you're going to have to figure this out. Which one am I going to feed? Which one am I going to is going to allow to lead me? Which one? Because one of them is going to dominate. One of them is going to win. Don't, don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel has good hope. That's what it's called, the good hope. Through grace. Good, it's good. Yeah, I love things that make me remember about the hope. Remember what Christ did. Amen. And when you can see, when you can see this vividly, you know, and, and this, is what, this is why we meet. We, we want to be edified. We want to be built up. We want to be, to be um, enriched to where this thing about Christ taking away our sins. And we, when you see Christ, your sins laid on Christ, when you, when you see that, it does something to you. See, it makes sinning harder. It's like, I don't want to sin. The one that loved me and took away my sin would have to bear. I don't want to sin anymore. Why? Because hope is dominating. See, the, the, the gospel is more than just a story. It's become real. It's become, it's become my life. When I see that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 
If you, when you see it, you'll draw near to God. You did that much for me. You would send your own son. You would turn, as it were, your face from your own son so you could receive me. Well, then I'll come. I'll come joyfully into the presence of the throne with confidence. Why? Who comes joyfully with confidence into the throne of grace? Those who are dominated by hope. See? You don't come so, because you think God hates me and he doesn't want me there. It, you come because you've seen to some degree that God's made a way. He's, he's, he's opened up a way, a living way that I can come. God designed salvation. Now I know it sounds simplistic. He designed salvation to save people. Ah, that sounds too easy, doesn't it? The, this message that we preach is not designed to make you feel good about yourself. That's not, the, the salvation wasn't designed so you can walk around and say, I'm such a good person now. Although he has made us good people. I don't, I'm not minimizing that. But gospel was designed to glorify God. That's what, that's what it's for. It's going to glorify God. So when you come, you're glorifying him. I want to glorify God. Amen. It's designed to make you know, and because you know, make you respond. And when you respond, this is not something that's done in the closet. You glorify God. Others see you, and then they glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's what it says. They'll see your good works. Now, those that are saved, those that are dominated by hope, those that are walking in the Spirit, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Why? Because we know we've been reconciled to God. We, see, we've ta we're tasting of the powers of the world to come. And because of this, he, just like Paul said, we all should be able to some degree be able to say this, follow me as I follow Christ. And if that can't be said, well, then we need to rethink our theology. If I, if I can't come to Christ, I'm saying because of my own sin, because of my own delinquency, because I'm not pressing in, well, the last thing I need to do is tell anybody I'm a Christian. The last thing I want people to think is that being in Christ makes you sin. Before the gospel can produce hope in anyone, a few things have to happen. You have to believe the record that God's given of his son, and you have to crucify the flesh. In other words, you have to die with Christ. Nobody that's alive to themselves that refuses to die with Christ. And I'm saying you die with Christ when you take up your cross, right? You, you, it, we're not completely dead yet. We're on a cross. It's a slow death. But as you carry your cross, as you bear your burdens, now hope can become dominant. I don't... I don't I thought this thing through, and unless I'm wrong, I don't believe hope is possible in any other environment. I don't believe hope is possible if you aren't dead to Christ. What would you be hoping for? Isn't this the health wealth doctrine going out? You, you hope for a whole bunch of more of this world's goods? Is that what they're hoping for? Well, what if you get it? Then what do you... That's not hope. That's not hope in the sense that we're talking about. Hope is something that can't be seen. You're hoping in something God promised the gospel would produce. God said a lot about what he was going to give you in Christ Jesus. Now, are you hoping for that? Are, are you really in, filled with anticipation for what God said he would give you? Now, this is God's strategy. You're going to die with Christ, and he'll raise you up with Christ. Be seated with him in heavenly places. You'll start tasting of the heavenly goods. And that will create an anticipation for the fullness. That's the strategy. But what do you do with somebody who, who says, I'm a Christian, but they're not tasting of the powers of the world to come. They're not crucifying the flesh. 
they're not hating sin and, and loving righteousness. What do you do? How do you handle that? Well, you preach Christ. Nobody's going to live up, live, give up their life here that doesn't have a lively awareness of the one to come. The moment the preacher stopped preaching Christ, this hope diminishes. You can't, there's no way for you to maintain this kind of hope outside of a relationship, a lively <clears throat> relationship with God's Son. <clears throat> for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness. That's Galatians 5.5. 5. We're, we're waiting. The bulk of what God's promised is up ahead, right? I mean, would anyone testify that they have it now? I have the fullness. No. Then you don't understand what it is. If you would tell me that, I would just say you don't understand what it is because I got to have a new body. I'm in this position. I got to have a new body. Maybe you got your new one, but I don't. I, I got to have a new body. Amen. And when I get my new body, then I'm going to stop hoping because I'm already going to have it. See, until then, I'm, I got to keep, I got to keep hoping. I don't want to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. See, I'm filled with the hope of the gospel, quite frankly, because I don't have anything else to hope in. That I, don't, I can't find anything else worth hoping for. If God, if God doesn't come through with his promises, I, like Paul, would have to say, I'm foolish. I'm a fool. If, if it ends up that God doesn't come through and give me a new body then I'm just a fool. But he is. God is faithful. He is faithful. He will not forget your labor of love. He won't forget the things that you've... You've been laying up treasures in heaven. They're there. They're not going anywhere. On that side, no one can break in and steal and get a hold of them. Amen. You keep laying them up, and one of these days you'll have a body that can hold them all at the same time. Right? You just move right into your treasure. And see, as you start laying them up now, one by one, you lay up this, you deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and it's like you, you, you make a little bit of advancement. You say, I'm, I don't want that, I want this, and you lay up some treasure. You lay it up. And tomorrow you start laying up some more. You get up in the morning and you crucify the flesh, put off the old man, and you put on the armor of light, and you start battling again. It is a fight. A good fight. Amen. And as you, as you engage the enemy today, you start laying up some more treasure and some more treasure. Uh -huh. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware right now of all the treasure. I know it's there, though. But when I get there and I move into my new house, it's all going to be there. It's all going to be mine. And I'm going to be able to use it. Oh, I tell you. When you start thinking thoughts like this, you know what happens? You start hoping. Amen. Right? Hope is developed in you while you're walking in the Spirit. You're, you're hoping for things. I can't see the treasure, but it's there. I'm hoping for that which I can't see. One of these days, I'm going to be able to see it. If you've denied ungodliness and cast off the works of darkness, if you've denied yourself the pleasures of sin for a season, if these things that you're hoping in, if they at one point in time just, you had them, you know what you'd say? You'd say, this is far better. This is far better. No one on that side is going to look back and say, I can't believe I gave up all that good stuff back there. See, it was, all, it was all hurtful anyway. Sin is not good. And God's teaching us it's not good. The real good things he's laid up for us. He's catching us up to him. <laughs> he's, God's got to do that. See, we're, we're not as smart as God is. We're not. God's much more smarter than we are. <laughs> I probably said that wrong, but nonetheless, you got the point. God's got to get us up to speed. Salvation gets us up to speed to where we actually really do have a 
disdain for bad things, for wickedness and sin, and we have a love for the truth. Yes, if anybody would have told me one day you'll have a love for the truth, there was a time when Satan wouldn't let me believe that. No, no, you, you can't come. See, Satan knows what's in this book, and he knows that um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and he's not going to let you forget it. The new man comes in and he says, hey, hey, listen to me for a few minutes here. I'm going to tell you about some of the things that he's laid up for those he loves. I'm going to tell you about a land where there is no sin. I'm going to tell you about a land where all you got to do, all you got to do to obtain it is to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and follow the lamb wherever he goes. You just keep on, you keep running the race with endurance. You keep doing that. I I'm, I'm, praise God for the new man. See, this is the purchased possession. Why does God want his children there? Well, these, these are his children. These are the ones that Christ died for. These are the ones that he bought with his own blood. So now when, when, when you, your hope starts building higher and higher and you've got a dominating hope, See, you're going to reason this thing out. You say, I'm one of his children. That's why I find myself, that's why I find myself being built up when the brethren talk. I'm one of his children. He's given me grace. Well, now, if he's given me grace, if he would do that, well, then um, he's going to, the one that started it is going to finish it. He's going to keep me from falling. He's going to present me faultless. He really is going to do that. But it's not by works of righteousness that I've done. I acknowledge that. But see, laying hold on eternal life is a full-time job. Amen. This is something you've got to do every single day, every single morning. See, the exhortation would be wasted on those. The exhortation to lay hold on eternal life would be wasted on those who had no part in laying hold on it. What does it mean for God to tell me to lay hold on it if... It doesn't really make any difference if I lay hold on it or not. No, lay hold. You do it. Lay hold. And don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Hope will dominate only to the degree that we are imbibing the person of Christ. As long as you stay with Jesus, I guarantee you, He like kindles the fires of hope. Yes, Keep believing, don't let go. It's just, it's just a little while, a little while. Yes. He that comes shall come, and you're going to receive your eternal reward. It's there in my Father's house, our many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I come again, I'll receive you. Un or when I come again, I'll receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. Hope won't let that go. Hope says, no, Lord, you promised to come back. So I'm hoping for you too. I'm filled with an anticipation that won't let go. Remember it says, that song says, oh, love, that will not let me go. Jesus isn't going to let you go. He's not. Satan may try to drag you away. See, that's what sin tries to drag you away. Hope says, no, you can't have my children. These are mine, and I'm not going to lose one. Not one, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The hope of the gospel, brethren, there is hope in the gospel. It's there. And it's for every man to work out your own salvation with fear and tremble, to lay hold on eternal life. Thank you, brethren.